Hey there. So now we're going to talk about seismic resolution. So as a quick reminder of what causes a seismic reflection, we're looking at reflections in the earth with seismic data um, at the interfaces between different lithologic layers. And so these are dependent on the acoustic properties of the rock layers, um, sometimes called I or Z or AI, depending on the different textbook or reference that you're using, which is the velocity times the density. Specifically for acoustic impedance, the P wave velocity. Um, and so this is what's most commonly referred to. It's where you have zero or very small offset data, which means the energy is traveling straight down into the earth and pretty much coming straight back and being recorded. We'll talk later on in a later lecture about elastic impedance, which is where we start to consider the shear waves and the role they play, which is really important for fluid detection, um, hydrocarbon detection, and those types of things. And so just as a reminder, from our uh, acoustic impedance, we get the reflection coefficient, which is the difference over the sum of the acoustic impedance of the two layers. So if we have a larger difference in the rocks, like we might from a hard shale to a soft sand that's filled with gas, we'll get a larger reflection that we can look through, look for in the seismic data. Okay, so just a few reminders. These reflection coefficients can be positive or negative in value. Okay, and so that'll flip the direction of our, our wave from a peak to a trough, depending on the reflection coefficient. Theoretically, they vary from negative one to positive one, but commonly what we're actually seeing in the seismic data is, you know, 0.03 to 3, point, negative 0.03 to positive 0.03. Okay, um, so we can look at reflection coefficients at that non-zero incidence angle. Um, but for most of this class, I'm not focusing on this. I just wanted to mention it, but we'll talk about uh, the Zopritz equation, which I'm showing here later on in a, in a later lecture, where we may be doing uh, seismic inversion or thinking more about AVO effects in the seismic data. All right, so back to my favorite image, which hopefully you've memorized by now if you've listened to the last couple, couple of videos. Um, so I just like to remind you that we can relate that seismic response that we see on the right hand side. Well, let me get my pointer on. Wait, I lost my mouse. This happens in class all the time. Um, so we can get the uh, difference from the we can understand the relationship between the seismic wave or this convolved response and relate it back to the lithology of the Earth, which is what we're interested in as geologists. Okay, so seismic resolution is a really fundamental topic that I want to talk about because it is what determines what we can actually see, detect, interpret in the subsurface. So there's a uh, lateral resolution and vertical resolution. So I'm gonna start with vertical resolution. Um, and so vertical resolution is giving us the, you know, telling us what our ability is to highlight or interpret those individual peaks related to the top and the base of the geologic unit. Uh, lateral resolution um, is looking at things more in map view. And what the resolution both laterally and vertically uh, are dependent on is the frequency, um, the frequency and the local velocity in that area of interest that you're trying to interpret it. So your resolution will change in different areas of your seismic data and with depth. Um, we can also get interference <laughs> of our wavelets, which can obscure some of what we're able to resolve in seismic. Um, and I'll talk about thin bed resolution also. So how thin of a seismic bed or a lithologic bed can we see in seismic data. Um, so these are some great examples from Chris Liner's uh, textbook, which I, I highly recommend if you want to learn more details. And so what he's showing here is a two layer model. So we've got our, uh, you can see the velocity, we've got our upper layer with a slightly lower velocity than our lower layer. Okay, upper layer has lower density uh, than the lower layer which means it has a lower acoustic impedance than the lower layer. So we go from the impedance to our reflection coefficient. Okay, so we've got a positive reflection coefficient. So if we have a lower frequency, peak frequency of 20 hertz, this is what our seismic wave would look like here. If we have a higher frequency, this one's around 40 hertz, 
we would see something more similar to this one. All right. So now let's get a little more complex, okay, to kind of talk about a three layer model where we have that thin layer kind of sandwiched in the middle. All right. So in this case, our middle layer is 55 meters. It's got a velocity of 3000 meters per second. We can see that we have two positive reflection coefficients, one after the other. And so if we have 20 Hertz uh, peak frequency, we've kind of got this uh, shape. I don't know, it reminds me of the elephant under the blanket in the, <laughs> the Little Prince <laughs> book, um, where we can't really clearly resolve that, that middle layer. Like we could say, yeah, there's definitely something different going on. Um, and we just gently see those two peaks. Um, and then for the 40 Hertz uh, peak frequency, we can clearly see both the top and the base of that middle layer. Okay, so the bed is resolvable at 40 Hertz. Um, and we would say it kind of acts as a thin bed where it's just detectable in uh, the case of the 20 Hertz peak frequency. We can make that more complex. And in this case, look at a, a seven layer model that we've convolved. And so here there's a lot of different things you could spend some time looking at. Um, we've got just kind of jumping down to the bottom here. We've got this very thin, what is this third layer? One, two, three, third layer right here. Okay, um, and you'll notice that with the 20 hertz data, we, we wouldn't even honestly be able to know that that third lithologic layer exists. Um, you know, we, we can get a sense of it in this case now at 45 hertz. So we would say it's kind of resolvable there. But you'll notice if you kind of squint and look in a little bit that um, the, the peak of the seismic wave doesn't align perfectly with the interface. Um, so these are things we all want to kind of just continue to keep in mind in terms of resolution and frequencies. I often talk about resolution and the concept of detection. And so I like to explain this as detection is the ability to identify that a feature likely exists, where resolution is the ability to distinguish two features from one another. And so the example... Um, that I always give my class <laughs> is that we're driving down an interstate, you know, I'm in Oklahoma, so we've got these long straight interstates. We're driving down it at night and I can notice that there's a light off in the distance. And so from far away, I can't tell what type of car it is, but as it gets closer, but I'm detecting it, but as it gets closer, I can resolve perhaps that it has two headlights and know that it's a car or a truck as opposed to a motorcycle. So those are kind of an easy way to remember the difference in the terminology. All right, so with thin beds, they're really, really interesting, and I'm gonna show you how in the next slide. Um, but I wanna introduce this concept because oftentimes, I don't know, I used to work this field uh, right offshore in Louisiana um, called Bay Marchand, and we could drill wells very cheaply. So we could so we could target like 14 foot reservoirs, which were below the seismic resolution of, of our data, um, but they would act as thin beds. And so sometimes thin beds could be uh, very much of interest. Um, and so kind of looking at this case, we've got a very thin bed. In this case, we've got a sandstone sandwiched between two shales. Um, and we can notice when our, you know, kind of thinking about our frequency, um, if our frequency is very large or you know, kind of shown in this case up in A, we can't see the difference. So you can see here our peak and our trough don't align with the interface. Um, in our case where our bed thickness is lambda over four, we can clearly see the top peak and the base trough. Um, anything bigger than lambda over four, we can also resolve. So when we get to lambda over four, um, in terms of our local velocity and frequency of our wavelet, that's where we're getting into the thin bed tuning. And so one very classic way to talk about this is in terms of the wedge model, right? And so this wedge model um, as shown by Hart, we've got a wedge of sand, okay? So this wedge of yellow sand uh, between two shale layers, okay? And so we wanna look at how thin can we see <laughs> resolve um, that, that sand layer. And so you'll notice when the sand layer is thicker, we can clearly see the peak and the trough aligning with that wedge. As the wedge gets 
thinner and thinner and thinner. Um, we start to see, I think in this third line, one right here, maybe in the fourth, we start to see constructive interference um, between the side lobe of the base with the peak, with the peak at the top of the sand. And so that ends up artificially increasing. So you can see that where I'm trying to circle right here on the slide. So you can see that the amplitude right here where it's thinner, um, because of that constructive interference with the side lobe from the base, we get a higher amplitude, which is kind of cool. Um, and then the amplitude starts to decrease as it gets thinner and thinner too. And so another way to look at it is we've got our sand layer. Um, here we're looking at that increase in amplitude um, when we get to that lambda over four thickness. Um, and so it's it's a good tool um, that we often talk about that kind of anomalously high amplitude response. And so it can actually make those thin beds appear more prominent um, and easier to see than the thicker ones. Uh, but the one caveat you have to think about is that if you're looking for hydrocarbons, sometimes you think a higher amplitude means hydrocarbons. So you want to keep in mind that a higher amplitude can also mean that you have a thin bed. Um, in terms of resolution, if you have very noisy seismic data um, or different velocity contrasts, those can all obscure your seismic uh, reflections also. And so those are things to keep in mind too. And so I love this picture um, of the Harborview Tower, um, mostly because of, you see this little blue wavelet type feature here? Okay, so um, you'll notice that the wavelet, the wavelength of that kind of architectural feature is about eight stories. Um, you can kind of round that up to 25 meters. And so that would be a 40 hertz wavelet which if you remember from a previous lecture is kind of about the standard frequency that we have um, in the you know shallow crust that, that we'd be interpreting. Um, so I, I just find that really interesting because it kind of grounds the idea that that wavelet, you know, that couple of stories tall is kind of what we're able to resolve and see in seismic data. This is another kind of classic example um, showing a, a seismic wavelet here doot, doot, um, with some other features. I think this is a Big Bend um, a clock tower. You know, it's would be able to just resolve that um, compared to what we might see in a well log. So just kind of giving us a little bit of perspective of what seismic can resolve. Okay. So just to kind of sum up vertical resolution, um, we want to keep in beds, keep in mind that even when the lithologic beds are below tuning thicknesses, they may still be detectable in really good quality 3D seismic data. But the interferences from different reflectors can complicate our interpretation. And so there are some techniques for sub-resolution mapping, um, but they're more sensitive to higher noise and the wavelet characterizations. So just things to keep in mind.